Oh, hey everybody. I'm gonna switch my, I'm gonna switch my display really quick because I am sharing the wrong one. Give me one second. There we go. Goes to show you take a few week, a couple weeks off and then everything goes to bunk. So it's that time. It is noon mountain time. I'm actually West Coast time. It's 11 for me. I know that I've got a friend from Romania. I'm going to give him a shout out in just a second. It's 9 p.m. over there. So wherever you are, thank you for coming and happy, happy, happy new year. This is our first session of the new year, and we were bantering about this week who was going to do it. I either got the luxury or the privilege or drew the short straw, depending on how you think of it. But either way, thank you for letting me be your host. Um, when we were talking about topics, we were like, oh, I'm going to ease into the new year. And I was like, yeah, but I had a, a, a forum, someone from the forum who his name is Mihai. If you don't know Mihai on the forum, I'm giving him a little shout out. He might be on the chat actually right now. He's one of our sages. And a sage, if you don't know, is basically someone who volunteers their time helping people in the forum answer questions. And Mihai, uh, along with a lot of our other great sages, I know everyone knows Dave R and Box and some of the other ones, and I'm, there's too many to name. But th these are just great resources. They're people who are there to answer your questions. And he says, uh, over the holiday break, he said something about, hey, Eric, love your landscapes. Love the technicality, the technical detail that you get into. Would love to see something um, more of that. And I said, OK. We're not easing into the new year. We're going to go big or go home. We're going to do uh, what you see here behind me on the screen. This was actually a project that I did many years ago um, in Utah. And it reminded me that there was some really fun challenges that I had grading it. And I'll show you in just a second. This is just uh, well, actually I can spin around here. I can actually spin around and talk. But what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you through. This was done uh, as a, for our master planning. Just It was really just a design exercise so that they could understand the impact of the grading that's going to happen on this slope. Because as you can see, the entire, all of these units here, these apartments or condos or whatever they end up being, they all sit tucked right into this slope, right pressed up against this highway. So this was the whole point of building the model was is that the city or whoever was going to approve the project, they can't visualize it without. Um, oh, I'm going to I, don't worry, Donovan, I've got a co-host with me. I'm going to introduce him in a second after I finish our topic here. So the basically the point is they couldn't visualize it because it was, all they had was plan view. Right. And plan view, as we know, is really hard, especially with grading when you have retaining walls. So this whole model was built so that we could um, figure out what the impact of these retaining walls was going to be, especially to people who are sort of driving past the highway. So that's what we're going to do today. We're probably not going to get all the way to the finish line, but we're going to spend a lot of time on the grading, which is basically the grading fundamentals of what got to this sort of point in the process. And some of the things that I think through uh, when you're dealing with per existing grades, proposed grades, master plan, buildings, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I've got a little warm up exercise, but before we get actually started, I do want to introduce our co-host, Mr. Donovan. Would you like to introduce yourself or say any words to our lovely audience? Yep. One of these days we're going to get Donovan in front of the camera more, but right now he we, he's uh, very useful behind uh, behind the scenes. So thank you, Donovan, for being uh, my my partner in crime here on this one. Great. Speaking of uh, all the people, this is why we do this. Uh, actually, well, part of the reason I just like to model for fun. Um, oh, no one's hearing Donovan talk. Uh oh. Well, where's Matt when you need him? Matt, everyone pause for one second. We can we, usually Matt. Yeah, that's or usually Matt's the yeah, it should be. 
Yep, and my system audio shows my What's that? Oh, blue. it was running. Oh, I'm sorry. Huh. Can can you hear me now? Can can the can the people hear me now? I'll wait. I'll wait to make sure everyone can hear Donovan because he was talking, did a great introduction for himself. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> All right. Hey, what would a live be without technical difficulties? Uh, Happy New Year, anybody, everybody. Uh, the thing that I was trying to say, which I guess I was talking to the ether because nobody could hear me, uh, is I'm I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm still a voice that a lot of you may have heard. Uh, not a lot of you have seen my face unless you watch the 2022 year in review video. Uh, so if you have seen that, you know what I look like. If you haven't seen that yet, go and check it out because it's a good chance to get to know all the people on the team for the videos that you guys watch here on our SketchUp channel yeah. every day. Yep. Yeah, definitely plug our YouTube channel as well. Um, okay, well, thanks. Sorry to make you do that twice, Donovan, but hey, like we're gonna get all Sorry. of our we're gonna get our glitches out of the way in the first couple of minutes, and then that way we can just go uninterrupted um, the rest of the time. So let's hope that's it. So yep, any other good. housekeeping items? Otherwise, we're just gonna get we're just gonna dive right into it. I just want I mean we said our thank yous, did my plug, did my shout out to Mr. Mihai, who hopefully is in attendance. Oh, anyone from anywhere? Any anyone new? Anyone? Anyone exciting for grading in particular? Any comments that we want to sort of start off with? Otherwise, I'm just going to roll into it. Looks like we have some people from the UK and from Syria and Canada. There's a lot of, Syria. Uh, a lot of Welcome people out Syria. there. Syria, nice. All right. Well, we'll I know we're going to have some people trickling in. So if any shout outs, feel free to relay those to me so I can say hello. So. Will do. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of context because I'm going back and forth. I started out by introducing this model here, which is basically a finished product that I did for an actual project. But um, in 2018, right after I started, I joined the SketchUp team. It was when we did our first uh, base camp. For those of you that attended, uh, it was in Palm Springs in 2018, and I got the luxury of being the first person to present at boot camp. And it was my first time presenting at a base camp or a boot camp. And I made the, I, when we were doing topics, I was like, oh, let's do this big landscape. So we're gonna do big grading and train. So people really wanna push their grading skills. I got that very first time slot and everyone's rolling in, right? Most of them are jet lagged. They're rolling in with their coffee. Everyone's tired. I mean, and I felt kind of instantly bad where I was like, okay, you know, this is maybe not the first session you wanna start out with. You wanna end on a session like this, but, Lesson learned, some really great content, some really great feedback, and we're gonna go ahead and replay some of this stuff about four and a half years later, now that we're in 2023. So that's just the background context for sort of where I, why I have this and what we're doing with it. Um, and Donovan, I, 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 you know, I talk a lot. Please interrupt me anytime. And I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my next screen. I'm gonna make myself small using the magic of technology. And I wanted to start with grading with a little bit of a warm-up exercise because I think that the even for people who do grading a lot and everyone, people who know sandbox tools and things, let me make sure that my large tool set is showing. It still is, it's still a tricky thing. It's something that I think a lot of us avoid. You'll notice SketchUp models, a lot of times we work flat. And then only if we have to do we sort of migrate to working with terrain, we kind of avoid it at all costs. So we're gonna go ahead and do like uh, spend a few minutes doing some little warm up exercises just as a refresher. I'm also gonna go ahead and open up. This is a good time to start with my sandbox tools. So I'm gonna to try to use native tools, but there are gonna be a couple of extensions that I might introduce as well. So one thing I'm gonna do is it uh, is it possible to do what you're doing without the uh, without these extensions, or do we need these extensions to do what you're doing? Uh, that's a good point. Um, I'm like I said, I'm going to start with the non extensions. And then when I get to an extension, we'll talk about why I use why an extension might be a better way to go. Because uh, there are a couple of things that you probably cannot do without an extension. But a lot of this is gonna be native tools. And I do like to try to focus on native tools, even though that sounds like, oh, doing really complex grading, you would think you would need some really, um, some really good extensions. So this one you just this is super simple. This is just a refresher. I mean, from contours, 
From contours, you'll notice you don't need contours. All you need is a starting point and a stopping point. So basically, as long as you have two lines, I've locked my walls. So if I select both of these, you'll notice I've selected the top uh, line and the bottom line. Running from contours, what you're going to do is basically it's just going to interpolate. So if I turn on my hidden geometry, all it's doing is stitching together, it's triangulating, which my friend Daniel Paul likes to explain the difference between a tin and a quad mesh, which if we need to, we can get there. But for those that are interested, that Sandbox Tools does use what's called a TIN, which is Triangulated Irregular Network. I believe that's what it stands for. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Now, that's a really simple one. I've got a starting line. I've got an ending line. And all of the stuff that I'm showing you here, it's relevant to what we're going to do with the more complex stuff. Some of the, when I say big grading or big terrain, we're going to be doing this stuff too. We're just starting small. If you want more control, obviously, in your surface mesh, then you need to put those intermediary contour lines. So in this case, what I've done is, you know, you'll notice that if you know, if you have experience with grading, then you can read contours just in 2D. So if I go to plan view, I can look at it and be like, well, if it's convex or concave, it tells me whether you're going to get a ridge or a valley. And I know it took me kind of a while to figure that out. So if it's going this way out towards the, as it goes down the hill, you're going to get a ridge. And if it points up, meaning that the, co the contours come together in like a V usually, that means that it's a depression. That's usually where water will carve um, something out. So again, if someone's got any comments or questions in the comments, um, just chime in. So if I run the same from sandbox mesh, uh, some from sandbox, or sorry, from contours of the sandbox, you'll notice now I get a much more detailed mesh. I may have to turn on my shadows. If you can't see it, sometimes just changing either the lightness or darkness slider or changing the time of day yeah, it doesn't really see it probably because my my mesh is not very detailed but sometimes that'll what it'll do is it'll show you those so now all of a sudden i have a ridge and then that drops into like a gully like a little valley because i have those intermediary contours now that was a really simplistic example but what if you wanted to what if you had you were doing some grading around a particular site whether it's a pad grading or in this case it's a landscape planter there's no you may not have if you're lucky you've been somebody's given you contour lines and if you're extra lucky they're accurate they hit where they need to and if you're extra extra lucky they've already been elevated to their appropriate z values usually you don't get any of that if you're lucky you get a 2d contour um a 2D CAD file, which then needs to be imported, scaled, placed, elevated. It's quite a bit of effort. So a lot of times you end up being like, well, you know what? That's more work than it is for me just to grade this myself. So so would the landscape architect be the one that would be doing all of that preliminary work before the model is is made? Um, it's going to be a combination. You said, yeah, you said that that someone would, would give you all yes. of those gradients. Who's Who would be doing that? Usually, if it's a really big site, you're going to get it from probably an engineer, especially if you're doing, if you're modeling in existing conditions, it's going to be from uh, what they would do is do a survey. So they would plot the whole thing out. They would use, you know, scanning equipment or whatever they use now. And then they would kick you back a really, really complex, you know, sometimes they give you points. Sometimes they give you, I wish I had a file handy, but I didn't have one for today. Uh, but basically, you're going to get a survey of like, well, here's where the existing trees are. And so what you would do is you would filter out the contours. Again, you'd get major contours and minor contours. Usually every five feet, sometimes every 10 feet would be a major contour. And then every one foot would be a minor contour. So depending on the level of detail, if it's a really big site, you might only use minor, uh, sorry, major contours. So hopefully that answers your question. If it's if it's if you're doing the design, then as a landscape architect, if it's a park or a plaza, your that team will be doing the um they'll be doing the the sorry the grading themselves okay all right so 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 i've got this wall here and i've got some sidewalks so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use this next example i'm going to do the same thing i did before but this is a bit more complex is i'm going to actually use the geometry i'm going to use this wall here to figure out um where i want my grade if i wanted it just a simple just kind of berm up like that where I want to kind of, so that I don't, to reduce the amount of, um, what is it, to reduce the amount of wall, that retaining wall that shows. Or if I wanted something a little bit more, I don't know, call it refined, I could come in here like this and I could bring the slope down just a little bit towards the end. And then what I would do is come up here and wait, find that tangent point, get rid of that extra nubbin. 
Now this is where it gets kind of fun and tricky. What I would do in this case is group these together. And I wouldn't always do this, but for right now, I'm going to explode them. And I would select, you'll see why I'm doing this in a second. I just kind of select the top surface or the bottom surface, copy that, hide it. No, not hide SketchUp. This is what happens when you're too efficient with keyword shortcuts. I want to hide, I want to hide this, paste just that in place. And what's cool about this is that if you erase just that line there, if I, I'm just erasing just the edges that I don't want. And I'm going to show you why in just a second. So what I get here is I have this line. If I double, if I triple click this, sorry, I need to also erase the faces. So if I triple click this, I can get rid of all those extra lines. And what I have is I have that inside line. Do I have something hidden there? Oh, that's a mesh. You can't see it because it's white. So I do my little group delete technique. Oh no, I'm just going to delete it. Oh. All right. So all you need is basically a continuous line. And now I've got that. I pulled those lines from the edges of the concrete. So now when I run my sandbox and I'm going to give it a color just so that you can see that a little bit better. Oh, you know what? It has a color. It's because I was doing it in monochrome mode. So then from there, you can explode that. And then I can do my group delete. And because I hit that, some people would prefer to use hide rest of model, which is obviously just a, a setting that you could use in the model info. But for me, I actually just like to hide geometry as I go and then unhide it. So what do you think about is that? Is that just that's a preference cool? or is that, uh, is that something that's a good technique for anybody using SketchUp? Uh, well, it's it's I think it's both. It's my preference, so I can just say I'm just speaking from experience. But it's also there's not there's not really a, a great way to do this. You're trying to grade in between existing things. You need something. You could draw the lines yourself if it's very simple. You could trace it, but you need that inner edge. And so I'm saying this is a quick way to grab the mesh, to grab the surface, in order to just get that line, and then we can close the contours on that. So. Kind of a fun little technique. These are just kind of fun little warm up techniques um, uh, to get us to the more complex stuff. Some people might say, well, yeah, you know what? That was really, that was fine, Eric, but you'll notice if I go back there to my sandbox and I turn my geometry on because from contours just does that triangulation. What it's doing is it's just creating a straight line. It's looking for the shortest path, which is a straight line from this edge to this edge. So if you look at that slope, you'll notice that it just kind of goes down like really sharply. Now in real life, sometimes what we get with landscape anyway is we berm, which means that you have a high point in the center and it drains on both sides. And like if you had mulch or something like that, it would fall or sand or whatever. You could, it could go to both sides. Now you're not going to get that with from contours because from contours is just going to draw that straight line from edge to edge. So this is an extension and I have to see if it's loaded. So I'm going to go ahead and check my extension manager really quick because I unload it when I'm not using it. You'll notice that a lot of them, a lot of mine are disabled. If I'm not, if I don't use it, I will disable it. Soap skin. There we go. And let's hope this one works because it, what it does, soap skin's funny because it it's set to expire after a certain while. So if you ever use soap skin and it just expires on you, it just means you have to re-download it. So hopefully, I didn't check this this morning. So hopefully it. So I already have that line in here. So if I hide this, you'll notice that I have that line. I've already drawn it for this little demo. So I'll just triple click. I'm going to lock this because I don't want to accidentally click that. Triple click. OK, so there it is. My thing selected. Now what's cool about Soap Skin is I can just, oh, it did time out. All right. Oh, it's, maybe it's going to let me do it. This is the fun of live sessions. So what it does there is instead of using the from contours, it it creates a mesh. And remember now, instead of it being triangulated, it is a quad mesh, which is, uh, you can see because of those uh, it's squares instead of triangles. That's why they call it a quad mesh. And then from here, you take this and I'm going to double check to see, okay. And you click this little thing called bubble. What it's going to do is it's going to ask you the pressure. So soap skin bubble means skin first, which creates the mesh and then bubble. If I type in, I don't know what number. I, it's been so long since I've done this. I'm just going to type a number in 30. 30 is the pressure. Maybe that's too high. Let's go 20. So what I'm doing is I'm inflating this. That's why it's called bubble. I'm inflating my terrain, almost as if I'm blowing air into it. 
what you have here is unlike that sandbox one that I just did before, you can see how it comes up slightly, depending on how much air pressure you inflate, it comes up slightly and then it drops back down. And that's really cool technique for getting this more like a, a berm shape where, as opposed to just a, a, a straight cross slope. I'm not going to do cover this one because I, the last couple of live streams, I think Aaron and um, and Tyson did, they, we spent quite a bit of time on Artisan, and I think I might have used it a little bit too myself uh, when I was doing the winter scene. So just kind of moving right along, one thing we're going to do too is you think about pad grading. So what happens with pad grading is that when we go to place a structure, if I were to place my structure, I'm just going to make a copy of it onto just onto the surface. And let me know if there's any questions, uh, Mr. Donovan, because I'm happy to explain or show something just a little bit a little bit slower. So if I drop this in, you can see the issue here is that I can either sit it on top of the surface, and then I've got a gap. If I turn my shadows on, you can see that a little bit better. I've got a gap. Or what I could do is push it down in. And if I do that, of course, what's going to happen is I've got half my, half my house is buried. So what I would do instead is use the stamp tool inside of SketchUp's uh, sandbox tools. But first thing you want to do is create an offset. So when you pad grade, essentially you're saying, well, this is the amount of area to be disturbed. So if it's cut or fill, uh, cut meaning we're cutting into the slope, fill meaning we're adding soil to a place that's lower. So I'm saying that, okay, well, let's for whatever reason, I, I don't want to disturb too much. So I'm just going to go maybe six feet or 10 feet off of from my building pad. And then I press this little magic button here called, I'm going to hover over it, make sure, does it tell me? Sometimes I mix up stamp and drape. It's stamp here. So what it's asking me to do is it's saying, well, where do you want to stamp onto? I'm going to stamp below me. And what it did was it's saying now, it's it's saying, okay, cool. Um, oh, I'm going to do that again because I may or may not want, I may or may not want this inner line. The reason why is because you may want the whole thing to be done as once as one shape, but you can so see that would be a... like your uh, your foundation, the slab yeah, exactly, for your foundation exactly. of the house. So if I was raising my slope up for some reason, that would be fill. So that term grading term fill, which it means that all that soil needs to be filled in, or you need a retaining wall. You'd need to retain that soil. Or if I was going to cut into my slope for some reason that I wanted to go down into a, a house that's sunk into the hill, I would drop it down. Now, a good grade, anyone who who knows grading, and I'm not an expert, so I won't claim to be, but you want to balance what's called cut and fill. What it does is it retains the soil that's on site. So if you cut, you know, a thousand cubic yards, you want to be, ref if you're lucky, you're going to fill a thousand cubic yards. So in this case, what I would do is say something like right about there. So what, what it means is that I'm going to need retaining walls along that back corner, and I would need one, maybe a small one here and a larger one along this side. Again, this is just made up, so it doesn't actually mean anything. I'm just having fun. And then what I, from there, what I could do is I could bring my, my, my building down and drop that in there. And you can see now it's graded so that it sits. And now this is a pretty extreme example. I wouldn't do this in real life, but, but you can see how this would work if you had just kind of a gentle cross slope, but you needed your building to sit flat. You could use the stamp tool to just kind of create that flat grading pad. We don't have any questions yet, but we do have people uh, coming at us from Honduras, South London, Costa Rica, Washington, uh, Nigeria. Whoa, everywhere. All over. Everywhere. 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 I love it. I love it. We are trying this. Uh, my goal, anyway, my personal goal, but our team goal in 2023 is just to see if we can extend our reach a little bit more. I mean, we've already got a great global audience. I know Brazil is up is every year. You know, we've got more and more um, coming online. I think that Obviously, language localization is something we've heard a lot about and we'll do our best with, but I love it. I love to do, I love SketchUp because even though I'm talking, I'm speaking English, the software itself is, it's visual, meaning that it crosses those cultural and language barriers. Um, thanks for pointing that out, Donovan. Uh, so the next one is similar to Drape is Stamp. So, and if you're, if, if you've worked with CAD line work and you've got CAD line work that's comes in flat, and you need to, for some reason, show where your building footprints or even where you, where a path would be on a slope, you could use the stamp tool. So the stamp basically projects down. Um, so what I'm gonna do is basically select what I wanna project down first, which is this little pathway that leads up to my, my building. 
and then I'm gonna click the stamp tool and come in here and I'm gonna stamp it onto my terrain. And what's cool about that is that um, now I haven't graded this, right? So obviously it, it wouldn't work from a technical standpoint, but if I just needed to maybe apply a different color, I could quickly kind of say, oh yeah, you know, that's where my path is. It needs to come this way. And there might be different reasons to do that. Maybe it's just to calculate surface area, or maybe it's just to, if you're viewing it from an aerial and you want to take that CAD line work and project it onto your terrain, that could be a good, a good pr approach. So stamp and drape, that's it. Now this one I use a lot, sometimes drape, especially if you're doing something really, really complex and you have a terrain that's really, really complex. If anyone's out there done this, you may know that drape doesn't always work, um, unfortunately. Sometimes you need to go in and just kind of close off an edge in order to get that part that you draped separate. So I often find myself, depending on what it is, using intersect. And you're gonna see this in a little bit when we get to the more complex terrain. But basically, if you have something that's just giving you a hard time, or even or even if you just don't even want to mess with drape at all, you could go in and take just this here. I'll often copy this part of my model, not the whole, not everything. You don't do this with everything, just a part of it. Go into your terrain mesh, paste it in place. And then what I would do is I would select what I want to clip out, almost like solid tools, but this isn't a solid. So what I'm going to do is select those two and say intersect, right click it and say intersect with selection. The reason why I'm saying selection here is because it's easy to say model, but sometimes you have things that are on hidden layers uh, or hidden tags or just been hidden. It'll still intersect with those. Other times you don't really realize how big when you say intersect with model. It's like if you have a really big terrain, you don't really realize how much stuff, how long it might take to intersect everything. So I kind of recommend you to think about intersecting with selection and doing it in smaller pieces. And that's just gonna make your life a little bit easier. So I'll copy that out if I needed to. Uh, I don't know why I got that little, the artifacts, but it's okay, it's not a big deal. I need to delete that. And what's cool about that is, oh, sorry. I'm on a parallel projection because this is such a big model. So now all of a sudden you can see, I can group that, I can hide it, and then I can go back in and just paste back in place. Uh, and I can do the same thing if I wanted to remove the retaining wall and just have it sit on the surface, I can just intersect that with the mesh as well. That's kind of a cool trick if you wanted to show what that looks like um, without it. Let me know if any of this is new to you, uh, Mr. Diamond. It is, uh, it is all new to me. Okay. I would have to say I, I know nothing about landscape architecture. Uh, when you you said grading in all of our meetings prior to this, I wasn't exactly sure what you were talking about, but now that you're talking about it, I'm I'm picking up what you're putting down. So, oh, cool, yeah. awesome. So another thing we can do here, and I know that Topo Shaper for some of you are saying, well, I would use Topo Shaper for this, and Topo Shaper is an extension by Fredo, and I think there, if you're dealing, depending on what kind of files or Topo you're working with, Topo Shaper may be the way to go. I just don't have experience. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because I forced myself to learn how to do it with Sandbox early on in my career. Um, so for those of you that are Topo Shaper fans, I won't knock it. I just, it's just not what I've sort of spent my early years playing with. Um, so if I do anything that's, um, I know Eneroth has an extension called Terrain Volume, which will basically take, do this here. If you're doing like a model or you're doing like a little diagram where you want to show like a, a cutaway of your landscape, you might want to actually show the soil level or something underneath or where the water goes. To do that the old fashioned way, you can just do what I did, which is just draw two lines down. And then, so you can get a square. And then if you're lucky, if this works, I can just sit here and say, intersect faces with selection. And if I, if, if everything was drawn correctly, what you're going to do is you're going to see that it separated this top piece and I'll just group that separately. I don't know if I would want the top piece. I usually you wouldn't, but so I'll delete that, but then you would group, I would group the bottom piece here. If you want to apply a different color to it, have some fun, have some fun. Hey, it's the new year. We're easing back into things. We're gonna have some fun today. <laughs> we do have a question coming in from the chat. Sure. Um, somebody's asking each time I use sandbox upon rendering it, it stops or it slows my rendering. Is there something could, that could be done about that issue? Well, the first question I'd have is what rendering program? Um, and the second thing I would I'd follow up with that and say, 
it's not great practice to be modeling while rendering, um, just because a rendering takes, unless it's Enscape, it's a game engine render, and in which case it's meant to be real time. But I've learned from experience with V-Ray, it's very CPU intensive. Um, I've learned... <laughs> I just like hands off. Like if you're doing a really intensive rendering task, just let it finish. So I know that doesn't answer your question, uh, but but Sandbox is very CPU intensive and rendering is very CPU intensive. So when you're putting those two together, you're kind of risking a crash and you're definitely, I think, going to see that slow down. Cool. Looks like we have uh, some people from Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, is that the, the right way to say it? From Vancouver, from Saudi Arabia, and Georgia. Oh, again. Nice. Georgia the, the country or Georgia the state? I don't know. Either I way. don't know. Could be either. Yeah. Either way. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. If you're just joining me, uh, we are warming up. We're almost done. We've got a couple more little warm-up exercises, and we're going to launch into something way more complex. But this is the foundation, literally, because we're talking about retaining uh, walls and stuff. We're building a foundation for some really cool stuff to come. So uh, stay with us. If you're not sure what we're doing here, and stay with us, it's going to get actually even more exciting. We've got a lot of fun stuff to show. So. In landscape, I'll, I'll say that I tend to work in 2D. As, you, as we all know, working in 2D is easier than working in 3D. I often work in both, meaning I work in 2D and 3D at the same time. I work in 2D in 3D, which because I'm doing 2D layout in SketchUp. So in a way, it's like you're doing both at the same time. So if I was doing, for example, a tree planting plan, I could choose to do it in plan view if I had some symbols. Or what I might do is just come in here. I'm going to use my stamp. I'm using hitting the option alt modifier to stamp these. So I'm going to go stamp, stamp, stamp. Sorry, I always have to say it whenever I do it. I always have to say it. So, so what I mean is, is that if I wanted to hit a certain spot on the slope, it would it might be difficult because what it's going to do is it's going to try to snap to a different point or a contour line or something. So I'll often work above my slope and directly. You'll notice this is directly above my slope, and when I'm ready. I will drop my things down. You guys have seen me uh, do this before. It's not new, but I will then bring my stuff down. And this is an extension. It's a free one. It's been around for a long time. It's called Drop GC. So I'll just click Drop GC. And what it's going to do, it's going to drop all of the trees down. And if for any reason you want copies, uh, you may, excuse me, you may want to make a copy first and then drop them. So that you. That way you'd have them both. But the problem is, of course, if you move one, then all of a sudden your 2D and your 3D are no longer in sync. So just kind of something to think about. Uh, I would not be able to get that exact location for every single one of those with the train. It would take me longer. I would rather do it in 2D and then drop them. So you'll see us. Uh, we'll do that too later, hopefully. We do have another question coming in. Uh, someone's saying, is it possible to take an object, for instance, something like a tube and push it into a mesh, mesh to make a ditch? a tube into a mesh. Uh, yeah, well, again, if you if we make our mesh, if we turn our train into a solid, uh, uh, let me see if I can do that. Let me try that. And if it's going to take too long, I'll, I'll, excuse me, I'll pause and we'll say, well, let's come back to that. Let's. But if I, if I take these two and group them together and explode them, I'm going to double check to see if I've made, I've made a solid group. So a solid group is basically means there's no holes, there's no stray lines, right? It's a clean, it's clean modeling. So for those that are students of solid modeling, I will say hats off to you. It is an awesome way to work. And I am just beginning to tap the surface. So let me show you, let me do what I think somebody's, if you don't mind, this, this is a good tangent. I don't know if this is a, this is, I don't Along know if this the same lines is that tangent, but somebody is asking, does it use the access as a contact point with the mesh? Mm. Oh, you mean when I dropped it? Probably when it was dropping. Yes, it uses. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think I'll double check that. I think it uses the access point. So I'll 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 try that again in just a second. Remind me, and then we'll do it. We'll change the access and we'll do that drop again, and we'll see where it hits. I'm pretty sure it does. So if I took this here, let's for example. I don't know, maybe I'm doing a pipe, someone's doing pipeline development or something and they needed to create um, a bioswale or something like that. Now, because these are both solids, and I can check that by looking at the my entity info and it says solid group. So because they're both solids, I could basically click this one first because I want to subtract that one from this one. So I'm going to hold shift and then click that one second. And then I'm going to find which one of these here is subtract. I have to look at it because that one, because I don't, I don't use it very often. 
And what it did there is you can see, hopefully that answers your question. If you're working as solids, I just literally subtracted that tube um, from my mesh. And I'll hide this one so it's easier to see. I did that, hopefully that answers the question. I think that's a really cool way to work. If you're working with a very complex train and you have a very complex thing that you need to carve out of it, a solid tools may be the way to go. But you need to turn your mesh into a solid first. So by, by creating this, this, this terrain volume, that would do that. I wanna to go to that drop question. I think the question was, when, where does this hit? So if I turn my, if I come up here to model info and I go to components and show component axis, this one, my component axis is, because it's a face me, it is where it should be, which is the bottom center. But let's for fun, let's go to my, I have an axis tools extension. And I'm going to say set origin just for this one. And I want to, instead of saying center, center, bottom, I'm going to say center, 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 and see what happens. Now, OK, so you can see the axis on this component has now moved up to the center. So let's try that drop GC one more time and see where that hits. Drop GC. Uh, oh, I might have to hide this. It might make it easier if I hide. Um... Oh, I don't know what it's hitting. It's going down in increments. I don't know if I did something wrong or fast. <laughs> Is to do there exactly. something that it's a hidden object it's running no, into? No, no, no. I oh no, oh, it might be. I'm going to delete this completely. Even though I hit it, it's still interacting with it. That's probably why. Let me try that again. No, it's just doing it in increments. All right. So I'm sorry, couldn't help you there. I don't know what it's doing. I'm going to go back and put that at the bottom and see if that fixes it. Yes, it did. So my advice is if you're dropping things, make sure that your axis is at the bottom. If you're doing face me stuff, your axis should be bottom center anyway. So, so I, I have a question. This, this isn't from the chat. This is just me just watching what you're doing. So you were saying if you had a two day, 2D layout of like say those trees, and then you could just drop them. Uh, if you kept a copy as the component uh, in 2D, and then change, say, like the placement of a tree because you were just guesstimating, and you know you got, you know, you got a diagram from somebody saying, "Oh, there's actually trees over here." If you changed it on the 2D component, would it automatically change the the placement elevation of the the 3D? You know, that's a great question, and that's a million dollar. If someone can do an extension that will allow two different components to register on different Z values, I think there could be a lot of money in that. Because if I go ahead and drop these, so I made a copy, the association between the two, there is none. They are copies of the component. So if I then went into went into even do, if that whole layer is two D as a component, it still wouldn't adjust the other the other trees. No. So if I move this tree, there's no link between those. The only thing I would suggest huh. is if you did something like this. If I go in and copy this, I'll um, I'll just hide this, and then I go into a tree component. And I paste this in place, and I'm going to go ahead and give myself um, a tree a color, and I'm going to lift that up. Now, what this does is that while, while you no longer have the link between the 2D and the 3D, ultimately the 2D is only a starting point to get you to the, to the 3D. So I don't need those. I'm just saying if you're working and you wanted to keep a copy, once you do the drop, the drop is done. So if I hide those and I go to plan view, from now on, I can get a plan view from my 3D. So if I move a tree now, I'm, I'm superseding. Once I've dropped them, my, my 3D supersedes my 2D, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I would obviously put those on their own tag so that, um, um, so that you know what I mean? So you can toggle them on and off. You wouldn't keep them on like that. Okay, all right, let's get through these because I only have a couple, I only have, um, um, one more, a couple more that are pretty quick, and then we can do the more complex stuff. Um, there is, for someone who, we were working with terrain up until now with contours, meaning that somebody's already worked out the grading, and they've either provided you the contours in 2D, or you drew them yourself, or they're in, you, if you're lucky, again, you get them in 3D. But sometimes, like when you're using Artisan, you're, we're grading in 3D, meaning that we're going to be in charge of the contours. So if I went in, I'll give you an example. If I went into this slope here, that maybe this is the existing conditions, and I launched my artisan, and I did not practice this, so if this 
goes to bunk, then we'll... Okay, so let me increase this to 20 feet. Okay. I'm going to push down. Let me know if you can see this. It might be difficult to see. Um, I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit. So just do you see how I'm, if I click, do you see how I'm pushing the slope down? Right? Can you see that? I'm kind of, yeah. yeah, okay. Yep, I can oh, see it. Okay, you can see it. What it's doing is, what I'm doing is I'm using artisan to sculpt. I'm kind of re I'm kind of pushing down. In real life, you wouldn't do that. You'd have to scrape the surface off. But I'm, I'm pushing that soil down so that that hill is no longer there. So the point I'm trying to make is that sometimes it's better to actually just do all your grading in 3D by sculpting, getting it how you want. And then there's a great extension called Make Contours uh, by TIG, which is available on Sketchucation. If you click contours, what it's going to do is it's going to ask you what your contour interval is. In this case, I'm going to say five feet just because I want to make sure that it doesn't, you know, take too long. So let's try five feet and see what happens. Oh, that actually was um, didn't take long at all, and that was too big. So I will go to one foot. So contours, you can basically enter your contour interval. So if you wanted major minor, you'd run it twice. You'd run them as 10 foot, and then those would be your minors, and then you'd run it as one foot. Those would, sorry, majors, and then one foot would be your minors. So I'm going to do one foot. Click OK. And then what you get, it's going to take a little bit longer because it's more information. It can't run contours on flat ground. So anytime you try and run contours on flat, it's going to get, you're going to get this, um, this grid. So you can just delete that or just think about that before you run the contours. So what's kind of cool about that is what I would do from there is I would go into obviously something like layout. I would scale this, export it as a DWG, and I'd send this to the engineer or I'd send this to the landscape architecture team and say, no, those are the grades I want. Obviously, if they need to fix it and say, well, no, 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 that's no, it needs to be 2%, they might adjust it. But I'll say conceptually, this is what I want, right? So I'm working backwards instead of forwards to get a terrain. Sorry, I'm in, I'm in like professor mode right now. So like I'm, I'm imagining my, my class of students and I'm like, okay, are we, are, are, yeah. are you with, are you with me? You know, are we still here? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. So, um, so apologies for for that if I'm if I'm lectury. Now one thing though is depending on how detailed your mesh is. Like for example, I this is the one this is the hill that I did before I sculpted it with Artisan. You'll notice that it has if I check my entity info, it has 6800, uh, so almost 7000 edges to make this little terrain. Now that's fine, but let's imagine now spreading this across something that's 20 hectares or 300 acres. You're going to get a lot of geometry in your contours. Well, SketchUp actually, and I like to plug SketchUp extensions because it's been here for a while. I don't think I have it installed right now, but it's called Simplify Contours. And what it's going to do is basically going to say, well, how much do you want to simplify it by? And this maybe was too much. You'll notice that it starts to get a little jagged. But this one right here, if I go into plan view and I kind of zoom out, you can see the difference because I'm going from 6,800 to 344 edges. But what you're doing is you're you are reducing a little bit of the detail in the contour line itself. But at the same time, you're also pulling some of that information out of your model, so it's not so heavy. Um, so this is kind of fun because it's not kind of fun. It's probably not the right term. This might be useful if you have a really big topo line and you really don't need that much information. You may want to actually pull some of that information out. So that's called simplified contours. So is there a way to, this is a question, another question we got from the uh, from the chat. Is there a way to generate topo lines without the extension? No, in, uh, well, yes, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll do this because it, it, it's not very hard to do. Um, for anyone who saw my Joy Division post that I did to the forum, if you've seen the, um, I won't, I won't ex explain it here. I just use this technique. So what you would do is if you were, if you did not use the extension or using SketchUp Free or something like that or um, SketchUp Go, what you would do is you would grab this and you would say, I want my contour interval. I just create a plane and I make the plane bigger than my slope. And I go up, I wanna make sure I'm on the blue axis and I go up one foot. And then I don't know what my top of slope is. So if I knew that I would do the math, but in this case, I'm just gonna say times 30 and that should cover it. So if I go X-ray mode, you can see my slope is kind of contained within these slices. It's almost like that Damien Hirsch. Didn't he the one who sliced up the shark and froze it in resin? Not saying that's a good idea. Um, so what you could do then is go in and find your, um, I don't know what the best way to do it is, but basically you'd select your mesh and say, intersect faces with model. 
again, I say model because I know this model doesn't have anything right there, but you may also want to be careful. And the be better habit would be to select all those contour lines and say intersect with selection, because then you're not getting any um, hidden geometry. You can see this is taking a while. I maybe shouldn't have done one foot contours um, because what it's doing now, it's actually intersecting every single one of those planes with the mesh. And if so, you can imagine if you have a really, if you have one foot contours, or if you have a really, really detailed mesh, it's going to take a little bit of processing power. So I should have done it with five foot contours just because it was just giving you a quick example. And I didn't need to really do it. So I've got time for questions while we let this finish or comments. Or I can just share some some other tips. Um, I've got a comment saying, I love your videos on advanced modeling techniques, Eric. Oh, thanks everyone. Yeah, I so apologies for anyone. I got a comment the other day that said like, oh, this is this was very good information, but you know, it's, it's a little fast. So I want to apologize to anyone who's just starting out with SketchUp. I try to let people know, especially when we do campus courses, what level of knowledge you ought to be before you go into something like this. Um, and that sets the expectations because I know that I know that it's overwhelming. I know from when I started, it can be overwhelming, um, and that's not my goal. My intent isn't to be like, oh, I'm going to overload you with stuff. My goal is to to hit the sort of intermediate to advanced level, and the people who are at that level, um, uh, I think they yeah, they I think they understand. Okay, so thank you for that comment, and thank you for those that are a little bit new and some of this is over your heads. Please be patient; it will come. So that took a minute. So that was the other thing when someone said, "Are you rendering and making contours and grading at the same time?" No, I'm not. Uh, just let it sit. If your little spinning beach ball spins, just let it sit. It's gonna. It's doing its thing. It's fine. So that was the way you get the contours where you actually intersect um, the planes. Uh, again, that method took longer. Um, so I, I don't recommend it. I recommend using the extension if you can. Um, Is this type of project where we need to save because we did get a comment? No, and we haven't because, done yet. No, save. no, because because I don't care. This is a demo file. We're going to lose all of this anyway. So um, thank you, though, for the reminder. Last last thing, I don't think we need this anymore because if you're going to do contour, you can go to layout. But I'm good. there is a reason why. Um, imagine I needed to figure out, we're going to get to this in a minute, where I need to draw this boundary in 2D representing the amount of area that's going to be cut from my slope. Now, if I tried to do this, it would be it wouldn't be helpful because I would be drawing a boundary on 3D contours. So I might want to flatten the contours. So NROTH has this great extension. And I'll select my contours. And I'll go down here. And NROTH has an extension called Flatten to Plane. Now, when you're grading, I use Flatten to Plane a lot. Because sometimes you're drawing something, and it snaps. And you're like, oh, crap, my face won't fill in. It's because it's snapping to a Z contour that has an elevated value. So it helps sometimes if something's not working right, go back in, flatten everything back to the same Z value. I'm going to click that now. You can see everything went shh. Flat as a pancake. And then from there, if I wanted to, um, or if I say I needed to connect these contours to draw a bounding box representing the slope, representing the area that's going to be cut from my slope, you'll notice how much faster this is now. Because what I'm doing is I'm doing this. And I know I'm cutting some, I'm literally cutting some corners for this just to finish this topic. So you can now see that I've, um, if I hide my contours, I now have a plane, a flat plane that I can use that represents that I can use to intersect with myself. We're going to do that in just a second, which is a great segue actually to end on that one. Because now we're going to do this. That was the warm up. Now we're going to do this for real on a very, very big complex site. So actually, I just want to make a comment kind of piggybacking off of what you said in terms of the, the content being, you know, intermediate to advanced. Uh, for those that don't know, like I, I'm new to SketchUp and new to the community and, and all that kind of stuff. And I still consider myself kind of a newbie to all this. And so being a newbie, I don't know the capabilities of the full capabilities of the program. And it's great to see, even though I don't understand exactly everything you're doing, it's great to see that these are things that can be done rather than just drawing, you know, a box with a center line down and pulling up into a roof and, you know, pushing in a door and things like that, that there's so much more that you can do with this program than just 
you know, the basic things that, that I'm used to. That's an excellent comment. Thank you for bringing that up because again, that kind of piggybacks on when I'm saying that I'm, I'm maybe going fast or I might be showing some advanced techniques. Well, a lot of what I like to do more than anything, especially because I've heard over, especially in landscape architecture school, oh, you know, Rhino and then Revit and all this stuff. And I'm just, it always just killed me because it's like, yes, they're specialized tools. If you're only doing one or two things, and I know that someone's gonna say, no, Revit's not a specialized tool, but I'm generalizing here to say that some of these other tools do do a better job at some things. But SketchUp does a better job at most things. And so what I love to do with this stuff is for first, I don't, I don't want to say call them naysayers, but for the people who aren't aware of the capabilities, I love these kinds of challenges where it's like, let's let's do it in SketchUp. Again, it might not be something that SketchUp was designed to do. Obviously, we'd use Civil 3D. If you're going to be doing grading every day, you can use Civil 3D. That's what it's designed for. So it's a good point. So I got, speaking of civil 3D, I got two surveys for this project from a civil engineer. One of them was for the existing contour, sorry, proposed contours. And you'll notice that they only propo proposed the main entry road, a couple of pads where the apartment complexes are gonna sit, um, a big, like a bioswale and a retaining wall. And um, a, again, a couple of sort of roads and uh, a pad, a parking pad. So they didn't even grade the whole site. They literally gave, they only graded like the pieces that they needed to. So this was really a challenge because it's like, you didn't even give me a complete grading plan. You didn't show me where it connects. You didn't give me. A... So I was given this sort of partial grading plan for proposed grades. And I was given a, a less detailed, but more complete existing grades. So this is, um, you can see it's very kind of polygonal or you can see it's a little bit more angular because of the way that how are they generated the tin on this. So that these are all, this is not a mesh, this is just topo lines. So the challenge here, if you, if you saw my project in the very beginning, and for those that joined a few minutes late, the challenge here was to get to this level, which is that um, we need to take out the existing slope, but only the portion where the proposed grades are going to go. And then we're going to put retaining walls in between those. And then we're going to put the master plan in and then we're going to put the buildings in and we're going to put the trees in. So you can't do that until we've done this, which is we need to create a mesh for both. And then we need to bring them together. So let's do that. So remember when I was saying, I just said, I just ended with flatten using flattened contours. So you can notice if I go sideways here, my sideways view, my I know it's kind of hard to see for hopefully everyone's seeing this on a big screen and not on a mobile because the line work is kind of small, can be kind of small to see, but I'll try to zoom in. You can see that these are the proposed elevations and then I flatten them using that contour that NROTS flattened a plane. And I, I'll show you two different ways to do this because you may not want to do this, but basically what I did was I came in here. I'm going to hide this for right now. I came in here and I painstakingly I don't know. I mean, I had music on, so it didn't, it didn't really bother me too much. It probably took me about an hour. Excuse me. And I just connected all the edges of, of the topo. Does it only work if you connect all the edges? No, because if you, if you, if you don't, let me show you why. So for those that already know, um, sorry, let me, um, un let me unhide this. For those that know Sandbox and for those that were looking, paying attention in the warm up exercise, you'll know that the Sandbox triangulates between the shortest distances. So it does not know to go in and say, connect these lines and then connect this one to this one, to this one, to this one, to this one. What it does, it's going to look for whatever the shortest distance is and it's going to triangulate between them. It's going to say, no, 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 I want to connect from here to here to here. The problem with that is then, well, what do you do then? And I'll show you right now, let's do it. I'm not gonna do the whole thing just for the sake of, if it takes a while, I'm just gonna grab a section of this, what I'm talking about. And I'm gonna come over here and sandbox this. It's kind of a funny thing to say, I'm gonna sandbox it. I'm gonna sandbox this and you can see what it does is that it filled in this whole part. But the problem is, is that this is existing grades. And again, I wasn't given a boundary. I wasn't given a, this is your cut line. This is your meat, this is your match line. This is what I was given. So I was like, this is what I have to work with. Do you see how that's filled in right there? That's a problem because I can't actually, that's going to create basically grades. It's going to either, <clears throat> excuse me, it's either going to sit under or on top of the existing grades, depending on what, what's happening in here with the existing grades. 
Those are existing grades, not proposed grades. I can't have a mesh in there. I need to delete them. So noted, noted, noted. Little tip. Yeah, noted. Pro tip. It took me a long time to learn this, but basically to figure this out, you can change the under styles. If you go to edit, you can change the style to what's called by material. So right now, by default, they're always all same. So all your edges are always going to be um, gray or black or whatever you choose. I tend to choose gray, so you'll notice I use gray. But if I want to choose black, that's OK. So that's by default. If I switch to by material, you'll see that some of them disappeared. That's because I have two different materials applied to my edges themselves. You'll notice I have white somehow. I don't even know why. I think it just came in from CAD. Uh, if I go into my, my material, it says I don't even know what color is applied. I can actually go and pick something like um, I don't know, pink for my minor contours. And I could come over here to my major contours. That's not my major contour. That's what I was just drawing. Oh, wait, hang on. Where are my, I got to double check. I lost it because if it's, oh, I know what I can do. If I change my background color just for a moment. Oh no, that's it. Okay. They didn't separate minors. Um, so if I wanted to change my retaining walls, I could go in and do the same thing. So I'm just going to pick a blue color for now. Um, pick a blue color, blue. And what's cool about this is that if I'm drawing, if I'm drafting, for example, if I wanted to trace the outline of this, you can see now, hopefully that's easier to see. I want to follow this retaining wall and then I need to snap this one. It's going to snap here. I need to follow this retaining wall because the retaining wall is going to be proposed grades. So this is what's fun. I'm telling you right now, grading is actually not fun at all. Um, but it's, it's challenging. And I think that's what I like about it. It's not fun at all. There's nothing fun about this. OK. So, so you get the point. The reason why I have this model, why I built this model the way I did, is because um, I don't want to do this together. It's going to take way too long. I'm not going to spend the rest of our time drawing that. I just want you to get the point. So what you're left with is a boundary. So if I go back to this here, that's how I got the boundary where I, I had just the extent of my proposed grades. What's kind of cool from there is that then I could sandbox, I could then run sandbox, I, I could then sandbox my proposed grades, right? So now you know, remember how I showed you just before, if you sandbox it, it's gonna give you all this extra stuff that you don't want. I can't use all of this stuff. And there's actually, I just thought of as I was this morning, as I was getting ready for this call, um, I just thought of another way to do it. I want to show you if you don't want to do, if that takes took too long to do the 45 minutes or whatever it took for me to trace my contours, there is another way to do it. I don't know if it's less time consuming, but you may prefer that method. So I'll show you that in just a second. I just want to show you why I do this. So I take this flat boundary because it's flat, I can extrude it. So now I have a volume that represents the volume that represents the extent. And the reason why I'm extruding it is because remember, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut, I'm, I'm gonna cut my slope out. I'm gonna use this as a cutter. So if I had a solid slope and a solid boundary, I could use solid tools. But if I don't, then I could use intersect with model. So I'm gonna use this to cut this out. So what I'm gonna do here is you can see I take that boundary, and whether I'm drawing it below or above, I tend to work above. So what I would do is when I'm ready. I would move this down and I would try to, I'll lock it to the blue axis. So I'm moving it down and I would move it into my slope. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that this extruded volume is nice and big, because again, you want to make sure that it goes below your slope and you want to make it sure that it goes above your slope. So that's why I extruded it so big. If you do, if you don't extrude it enough, you're going to see that it might not actually cover the extent of your, of your slope, depending on how steep your slope is. Um, so what you do then is you'd go in here and you'd select your mesh and I've already done this, but I'm going to go ahead and say intersect faces. And again, I would, I would probably recommend copying this, copying that cutting extrusion. I don't know what you call that. I'm just going to call it a cutting extrusion, pasting it into your proposed mesh and then selecting your proposed and selecting everything. The reason why we're selecting your mesh, because the mesh might also be in the same group as your contours and of your buildings and your tree footprints. So you definitely want to get in the habit of just selecting your mesh, selecting your cutter, select only those two, come over here and say intersect faces with model. And what's going to happen there is you're not going to risk intersecting with um, 
Oh, sorry. I just I did the I just did what I said not to do, um, which I said intersect with model. Intersect with selection. So now I'm going to have to sit and wait for it to spin because it's now it's trying to calculate everything as opposed to just um, what I had selected here. That's a great time for a question because I just did something. I just told you what not to do. <laughs> I <laughs> uh, don't have any questions in the comment, but we do have somebody from Palestine saying hi. Welcome. Yeah. And uh, we did have a comment saying, if people think that this moves too fast, remember that there's always the video to look back on later because we do uh, post these lives at the end of uh, at the end of every live session. You can go back and and watch the whole thing. That's right. That's a that's right. We're going to plug our own live stream. It's funny because we get you look at the view counts and they're really high, like when they first post. And then obviously, as you would expect, they drop off. And it's something for me. It's like, well, no, don't just don't just watch it because it's new. Watch it because it's good information. So hopefully everyone gets a chance. Um, obviously, the people that are watching live don't have to watch it twice, but hopefully um, tell a friend. Tell two. This is evergreen content. So that's uh, right. It'll be it'll be there. only applicable. Yep. Uh, where okay. can people find the Make Contours extension? That one is by TIG, T-I-G, and I believe it is only on Sketchucation. So if you, I don't want to say this because it sounds, it's stupid if you Google it, but I mean, again, that's not helpful. If you double check it, make sure I'm correct. So double check, it should be Sketchucation, Make Contours. Uh, I, mean, uh, I, I think it shows up as Contour Maker. I don't know if it says, I can't remember if it's, I think it's Contour Maker. If you type TIG Contour, you will find it. So that's that's done. So what what I did with that is oh sorry it's not actually done. Um, there's one little step you have to do. Um, I'm at, so what I would do here is is now what you're left with. And for those that watched my um, Tanner Springs Park, is that what I would what I would do is I'd come in here. It doesn't matter what color. Whoops. Oh, this is actually good. This is good because what happened is is that this one didn't close. So what I would have to, what I, if it doesn't close all the way, it usually means that there's a, um, something just, it didn't like something. So I'm going to ignore that for right now, but there is an extension by Chris Fulmer called label stray lines. So if there's a gap or what you can use is Tom Tom's edge tools. So if you use Tom Tom's edge tools, if this works extensions, oh, I don't have edge tools. What edge tools is, is you could say what's called close, um, gaps. So if you did find yourself like this one, you can see that this little parcel did not um, separate from the rest. What you could do is you could use either label straight edges, which will tell you if there's a gap, or you can use close um, gaps in TomTom's edge tools. So then I would go in and find that gap and I would clip that out. I'm not gonna do that right now because I don't have edge tools um, running. But what I would do is I would say, select all of these, select all in the same material. I'd group it and delete. Actually, I can, if it's only two pieces, I just triple, I double click, group and delete. Now I group and delete for those don't, that don't know why, if you just delete this, um, sometimes depending on what you're doing, um, that if that line, I just do that out of habit because sometimes that line's actually connected to something else. And so when you delete it, it's gonna delete, you're gonna lose this face too. So I do this thing called, I double click and, and double click and I group and then I delete. What it does is it makes sure that that edge that they share is always duplicated. So in this case, I didn't really need to do that, but hey, like I said, it's been it's been four and a half years since I looked at this model. So um, I think we're doing pretty good. So so with our with where we're at in the process here, if I turn my uh, if you turn my hidden geometry on, you can see actually where the you can see the road now. These are not the contours, so this isn't the con. This is now the tin. So the tin used those contours, and you can see where the road is relatively flat, and you can see that it's kind of like a midpoint. So all of a sudden we're flat. We've got some units, and then we have a, a grade change, and then we're flat, and then we have grade change, and then wherever you see wherever our topo ends, that is where we either tie into the existing slope, or that is where we need a retaining wall. So you're going to see that in just a second. I know when I'm when I'm doing this now, I'm thinking there's got to be. I always think there's got to be a better way. You know, it's kind of like a like a like watching an infomercial. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. But there isn't, though. To be honest with you, it's just this is just kind of a labor intensive exercise grading. There isn't a way you can't automate it. It's like rendering. It's like someone says, "Can you press one button and render?" Yes, you can, but your render's not going to be very good. 
you, it requires that you go in and you tweak stuff and you add a light and you think about the so with grading it's the same way i would like to think there's a better way to do this but the reality is is it's it's labor intensive so i do the same process here i do the same process by running my um from sandbox from contours or if you're a turbo shaper fan obviously by all means do that and then if I need to, um, I can clip this out. I want to show you really quickly uh, the other method. I'm not going to do it on the same thing, but I just want to grab a chunk of this. So I'm going to go into my existing contours, not all of it, because I want to make this to go. I want this to go this fairly quickly. So I told you that there's another method here. So if you instead of drawing that boundary and tracing your to the edge of your contours and then projecting that and then using it as a clipping tool, you could turn on your hidden geometry. So I'm going to hit uh, J for hidden geometry. That's my shortcut or view hidden geometry. And what you have is you have these lines. You can see, you can see where, um, oh, I'm going to go to my styles and I'm going to select, this is where having this style is actually kind of cool. Only this time I'm going to change this slope to a different color so you can see it better. Okay, maybe lighter. All right, so you gotta bear with me here. The reason why I'm doing that is because, um, <clears throat> so now you can see, you can see the difference between, oh, can I give this, can I give these lines? I'm gonna give these lines a different color. Takes a little bit of setup. We're gonna get there. That's all right. Okay. We're all we're all here with you. We're all here. Okay. Thanks, guys. It's hard because I can't see you. It's like that's the difference between not teaching in the class because you can't see your audience. So, okay. So you can see what I did there. I, I made sure that my topo lines were showing a different color. So this just makes it a little bit easier. So if I turn my hidden geometry on and off, you'll notice that the hidden geometry. It's pretty obvious where the hidden geometry is trying to make that interpolation between here and here. So I could do something as simple as taking this group, selecting it, and deleting it. You can only do that with hidden geometry on. So if I turn my hidden geometry off and I select this, you'll notice it's selecting everything. But with hidden geometry on, you can just select this and delete it. Or sometimes that's really difficult because you know it's really hard to get these really fine selections. But I found that with the paintbrush tool or the paint bucket, I could go in and just paint all of the areas that I know that I don't want to clip out. So then I would say select all on the same material. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting only the green or yellow, grouping that again so I don't lose that shared boundary and deleting it. So that actually might be faster depending on the complexity of your topo and what how fine of a, of a boundary you need. That actually, that method of just erasing that connection points, the connection mesh, that sort of extra mesh, may actually be faster than going in and drawing it. Just thought I'd share that. OK. So now we're just I'm just repeating the process here. So what I'm doing is I'm doing the exact same thing. So I'm taking that same clipping boundary that I made earlier when I clipped out the extra terrain from Make Contours. I'm clipping that out from my existing contours. So I already trimmed off my proposed. So if I move this, you can see, if I move this up, you can see I use the intersect with, go in and say intersect with model. And let me give it a second. You gotta kind of pace yourself with terrain. You gotta be patient because otherwise it's gonna be, it's gonna yell, it's gonna argue with you a little bit. So what it did is basically it gave me this mesh it gave me um, a separation of what is existing to be preserved or to remain and what is existing to be removed or regraded. And what's, what I need about that, what's what I, what I, why I need that. Sorry, I didn't mean to delete that because I might actually need that. I'm just going to go ahead and hide that for now. So what's important about this is that now I haven't showed, I haven't dealt with tags yet, but if I open up my tags, you can see that I, if I click color by tag, so just ignore the colors. These are just totally made up. It's just so that I can see what's what. That's all. What it means is that I now have what's called an existing. I have existing to be removed. 
So I can actually keep that in my model. I've grouped it. You can, you'll notice I've grouped it separately. So they're, so they don't stick together anymore. So this is now a group and it, once it's a group, cause remember you don't, we don't group, sorry, we don't tag raw geometry. So you group it and then tag it. So when I use my color by tag mode, you can see that this is um, on this tag and it gets to be frozen. Now there's a reason for keeping this. I don't want to delete the mesh because I might need to do a cut and fill exercise. I might need to show before and after. I might need to go back and somebody says, no, 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 that, that wall is not going to work there. We need to move this wall here. So that means I actually need some of that existing terrain. Um, I may need to bring that back. So I suggest grouping it, putting on its own tag, freezing it, and then now what we have, what we're left with is basically a hole in our existing terrain that we're gonna place our um, proposed within. Ready for that? When you say proposed, you, you're talking, what, what, it, what is being uh, proposed to put in here? This is what's proposed. This is the grading plan for the master plan. This is the grading, the, the grading contours for the master plan. So this mesh here, once it's been clipped, so this mesh here, that needs to go in that needs to come down into our existing so that's going to fill the hole so if you want i can just well you'll see in just a second so if i click on this tab because i've already set it up this way i'm going to hide these for right now we're going to come to those in just a second so which one is proposed proposed is okay proposed is red uh, okay Proposed. It, I, I labeled it. If I read my labels, I can actually see. So this is the um, this is the existing. Again, ignore the colors. So just I just color them whatever, just so as I'm working, and I'll, I'll color them later when I'm done. So this is the existing. I turn that off. I keep the existing around, and I bring my proposed. If I'm working, I usually work. Remember how I said I work above. So what I would do is I would work above, and I would bring that down. Or if you're working below, that's fine. You can do that. But I tend to work above. The reason why is because when you go plan view, you don't want to, You don't want what you're working on to be blocked. So always like whatever I'm working on is going to sit above. So in this case, if I turn off my existing, nope, that's existing to keep. This is existing to be regraded. You'll notice that I now have my two. I now have both of them. So I have my proposed grades sitting within. And you'll notice there's a couple of spots like right here. The, the engineers who did the grading, they actually did grade up to um, saying, take your proposed grades and meet the existing grade. But anywhere else, everywhere you see these gaps, do you know what those gaps are? So if I look at it in plan view, and I might have to hide some stuff. Yeah, I might have to hide some stuff. If I look at it in plan view, it looks pretty solid, except for this, for whatever reason. Um, maybe I, maybe I, that's, maybe that's something I didn't finish or whatever. Don't worry about it. But for the most part, it don't look there. Um, for the most part, it looks like it's enclosed, but when we tilt, this is where you'll see that it's not actually only when you're looking in plan view. This is why you can't grade in plan. View. This is why you can't show somebody a grading plan in plan view and have them understand it because it's, it's when you have a, a vertical drop that a retaining wall requires, it's, it's just. It's abstract. Contours are, they don't exist in real life. They're abstract. The only reason why we have this thing called contour lines is so that we can put 3D information into 2D information onto paper to draw topographical maps. That's it. They don't, they don't serve any other purpose than that. So this is why we need this, um, why we need this. So this basically tells me that we are going to need a wall and I have my walls on a different tag. I'm not gonna do the walls because I could spend the entire time just doing the retaining walls. Um, we're gonna do a couple other things that are gonna be fun here to wrap up in the next half an hour. But um, because to be honest with you, I don't even have a great way to do the walls. Um, so I almost should do the walls because that's gonna be the most challenging thing, but it's also gonna be the least fun and most tedious. So I almost wanna not do those today. But basically you can see that those vertical gaps, and I'm belaboring the point, you understand what I'm talking about. So anywhere that there is a gap between here and here, that's gonna be, you can see, sorry, I'm, I'm doing this because I've got so much stuff in my model that when you pan, that's why it kind of uh, bounces around a little bit. Um, so there's gonna be a little bit of it, you can see just by looking at this, there's gonna be a little wall along this backside, there's gonna be a big wall here. Uh, again, it's gonna come down a little bit. We're gonna meet, we're gonna come together, we're gonna meet our, uh, proposed and existing come together at this point. Little wall, big wall, medium-sized wall, 
And then again, a really big wall as you come around. You can see that this is the entry road. So that's why this big old wall. And um, I would say that this is kind of what not to do. Um, I really don't like big retaining walls. It just feels like if, you, if that's what you need to do it, then you just thought about how can I make building the house the easiest thing to do? And this is what's going to make leveling out the grades going to make building the easiest thing to do. But that's not, not, not is it the most aesthetically pleasing thing to do, but it's also probably not the most ecologically sensitive thing to do. So I'm, I'm, I worked on this project, but I'm also not necessarily advocating um, to do it this way. So when I click at my end here, what you can see is sort of where you can see this progression. So I, we started at the top and we kind of worked our way down to the bottom. And I want to go back to this merge one more time because one thing that's kind of cool about this is that I have both my existing and proposed turned on. So if somebody wanted to do a cut fill exercise, you could do that. Essentially, you could do sort of a rudimentary calc by intersecting the proposed, which is in this green color, with the existing to be removed, which is this pink color. And what you would do is you'd intersect those two meshes together. Same technique, same method we've used all the way up until now. Sorry, I, I, I try to zoom in a little bit because I know just by habit, I, I tend to work far away from the screen. Um, because it's a big because it's a big screen, so I can work further away. So the um, so in this case, what you would do is you would intersect those, and that would tell you a little bit about like how to balance your cut and fill. So if I look down here, you could see that if I inter if I cut out my proposed, that would tell you that basically everything in here is uh, that I just removed is being filled on top of, uh, and everything that's pink is going to be cut. So this would be my fill, and this would be my cut. So if I wanted to use that for any for any reason, or if that was helpful, even if it was just to draw a bounding box. You know, if somebody wanted to say, can you show me your cut fill line? I could go into 2D, project that, and then I would have a, a sort of a line to represent that, that area. So the next step, unless there's anything to review, it's not a class, we're just having fun. We're just messing around today. But unless there's anything anybody wants to see again, I wanna wrap up by saying, by going and now taking this to the next level, which is saying, this is great, but this is also, you know, Eric, this is, we're not exactly going to show this to the, whoever needs to sign off on it, whether it's the neighbors or if it's the city council or if it's the engineers or the, or whatever. Um, this isn't the final product. It was what we showed when we started. This is more, it's closer to the final product. So we need to do a couple of things to get there. Um, we so don't uh, we don't have any questions coming in from the comments, so uh, okay, we're we're ready when you are. Okay, great. I just check because you know, like I said, I just I talk and I talk and I talk, and so I want to make sure that I'm giving people yeah. a chance to. I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear from everyone else. Um, and I, most importantly, I want to make sure that like I didn't bore. I'm not boring everyone to death because I'm I'm trying to make this fun. Okay, so what I did was. I set up a new file. So I graded in one file. I tend to work in different files because um, especially when you're working with big sites like this, like I'm not going to then bring my trees in and say, oh, let's use my terrain file to place my trees. Because what you're doing is now you're laying out your trees in a file that's got millions and millions and millions of polygons. That's just going to slow you down. I would work in a separate file. Um, if anything, what I would do is copy my terrain or I would duplicate that file, then delete my terrain out. And what, what you would have is a property line or a grid line or, or an access point or something that says, ah, this is how you register it. So you'll notice I've got these two little like tick marks, my little guidelines. So if I do work above my site, I can just, you know, I can just make sure that I snap, you know, this corner to the site snaps there. So point is, is that if I'm going to do this, I'll do it in a separate site. So Let's see, I think this is the finished product. So I have to, so what I did was set up, let me see if I can do this in perspective mode instead of um, parallel projection. I grabbed, a, at the time I think it was Google, but now it'd be Digital Globe or Bing Maps. So I brought in a location, um, location terrain so that it's actually locked into real world. So if I did shadows or if I was to send it to Google Earth or something, it would be registered in the real world. And then the second thing I did here was, um, so I have this, I have this extra terrain. So I have two levels of, of terrain. The reason why I did it twice is because when you import terrain, you have a choice between going really big, but then you pixelate the aerial, or you could go kind of smaller and have higher res elution. So I did this one and I did 
hang on. I just want to, sorry, I didn't prep this. So I'm going to just, I need a little prep this as we go. I want to explode that. So there's a, there's a question that, that kind of gets to something you were saying is how, when working on models this large, how do you keep your computer from freezing or crashing? Oh, the only way to do that, there's two ways to do that, which is um, if you're doing something really intensive, uh, again, if I'm working with the buildings that came from Revit, then those buildings, even if they've been cleaned, those buildings are still going to come in as higher polygon than they should be for SketchUp. So like when I go to do my building placement, I would just, I would do those in 2D, but I don't need to do them on this plan. I could just do it in a separate file. So as long as the location of my 2D site plan, I usually start with like a 2D, like a location snapshot. Um, I don't think I have it here. I may have deleted it from this file, but when you do a geolocation, if you start with the geolocation, what you're going to get is a, both a 3D and a 2D. So you could, you could take that, that 2D and either do a save as into a new file, or you can copy and paste it into a new file. When you paste it, paste it in place. So what you're doing is basically you're working on a separate file, but you're working coordinate wise, you're working in the same place. So that way, when you go between the two files, you can either import or you can just copy and paste in place. So the first way to do that is just think about whether certain things like buildings and terrain maybe need to be separate. The second thing is just tags because SketchUp only renders. SketchUp's amazing. Everyone's like, oh, SketchUp's performance. No, what SketchUp's performance is, is that it's vi it's, re it's rendering everything. Unlike CAD or, or some of the other programs, um, it renders every, every pixel every time. So what it means is you have to just turn off things that you don't need at that moment. So if you did want to work in one file, all you have to do is just make sure you're only working on the pieces of the model that you need to and everything else is turned off. Like this one here has, let me just double check. It's not going to be the largest model that I've worked on. This one here is actually not too bad. Even with all the trees and buildings and stuff in from, from Revit, it's um, about 5 million polygons. So I worked on one that was like 36, 37. Uh, it was a master. It was quite a bit bigger. And that was fine too. All I had to do is I just broke the model up into chunks so that I was only working on one district at a time. There's no reason if I'm working on this district, like called the Marina district, I just, I'm only working on the Marina district. I do not need to see necessarily the equestrian district when I'm working in the Marina. They're not, they're not connected. They're not part of the same site. So it's kind of a long answer, but hope that helps. So I had to do the same thing, right? So I brought this this terrain in from from Digital Globe or wherever it was, wherever it came in from at the time, whoever was providing it, and I did I used the same boundary to basically clip out um, to clip out that this is going to be the extent of my my proposed, or I can clip out the extent of my my existing, depending on what I wanted to do. So then what I could do is bring in um, I then brought in my proposed here. I think this was, what did I, why did I not use, why did I not use my existing grades on this one? There they are. Okay, it's a little bit more accurate. Okay, so I'm gonna hide that. So basically what I did was, um, the reason why I had the, I did the digital globe first is because when I brought my two, if I turn this off, if I bring these, if I bring my proposed and existing now in, I can use, I can sample the texture. So I'm going to give you an example here. If I just paint over this. So when you bring it in, right, I'm going to paint over this too. Actually, you know what? Sorry, I didn't prep this. I just, this is what it was. It was already finished. So I think we're going to have to kind of, I'm going to have to kind of prep it as we go here. Um, I had the other file nicely prepped, but not this one. So basically, this is what I got. This is what I, now I'm ready to start this process of I bring in my Google Earth. So here I bring this in. I don't need the Google Earth right now. And the reason why, uh, I'm saying Google Earth, but you know what I mean, digital globe. So the reason why I don't need this right now is because the, what I wanted was I needed to see the more, I needed to know where the highway was. And the engineers who gave me this grading plan, you'll notice they graded just pretty much up to the property line. So if I turn this off, when I go to take my camera angle, when I go to take my final camera angle, I have no idea where I'm taking it from. So I did end up, I did end up putting more terrain in because not because I needed it, but because I needed to know, I needed more um, information about like, okay, this is the entry road and this is going to be looking up onto the site. So you're going to be looking at it like that. So now I have three bits of information. I have existing from digital globe, which is going to be much lower resolution. I have existing um, from the engineers, which is a medium resolution. 
And then I have exist, sorry, proposed from engineers, and that's going to be um, what I'm going to call high resolution. So one, two, three pieces are now merged together. Now to get this texture in here, this is kind of fun part. Um, I have, I think we should do this together. I think this is worth doing together. You just have to bear with me because I haven't. Um, so, because I haven't done this in a long time. I haven't done, I've done this, but I haven't done this on this file in a long time. So we're just going to go ahead and go for it. We're going to wing it. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this texture in. And the tech by texture, it's actually the um, illustrative master plan. So somebody might be, oh, did I say bring it in as a texture or an image? Oh, OK. So I'm going to turn this off for right now. Well, actually, I might want it on. OK. For this, you want to go to parallel projection. I want to scale this up nice and big. You can see that it is not the right orientation. Now, if you have a scale, if you're if you're smart, um, which I sometimes am and sometimes am not, I will have a scale on here and I'll use that to scale. If I don't have a scale, what I could do is I could go into the Google Earth. You'll notice I use the same Google Earth background when I did the illustrative plan than I did when I brought in the Google Earth. So I already used this at the time. Again, I'm saying Google Earth because I think it was, I'm just gonna keep saying that because at the time I think it was Google Earth, but um, 2014. Oops, not that one, that one. So, so what you can see is that you can do, if you don't have, it's not as accurate, if you don't have a scale bar, you could come in here and find something like a really significant feature or something like that and say, okay, where this silver car is, I'm gonna grab the road to the road. I'm gonna change my line style for this actually, if you can give me a, just so that you can see it better. So I'm gonna change my line style for just a moment. So it's pink, you can see it better. So if I go from here to here and measure that 26, 26 feet, which makes sense. I could, let's say 25, 25 foot. That might not be perfect, but that gives me a starting point. So I know that that part is in my model. I don't wanna scale this image itself. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to explode it. If I'm only tracing the image, I won't explode it. But if I'm going to be projecting the image onto terrain, you need to explode it. So I'm going to go explode it and regroup it. And the reason why is because now you can go into the group. I can find that same silver car, that one there, kind of a blue silver. Grab my line here, my tape measure, and go from there to there. And when I brought it in, actually, I was pretty close, 23 feet. I'm going to click that and say 25 feet instead. It's going to go up a little by a little bit. It says, do you want to resize it? Yes. The reason why I did that inside the group is because if you do it outside of the group, it's going to resize everything in the model. And I only want to resize this image. And then I'm going to come over here and turn x-ray mode on. And again, I'm going pretty fast and loose. I mean, there are ways to be a bit more accurate than this. But first of all, this is this is the whole point of this exercise was just to understand how this master plan is going to fit so that they can make go back and make changes. So this is maybe a week's worth of work. Um, actually, we may need to scale this down a little bit because you can see that my road my road doesn't line up. So I'm using this building here. Maybe a little difficult to see, but I'm in x-ray mode. So I'm, I can kind of ghost my building in. So that building is kind of, let's use that as my registration point on that side. And then you notice I'm using like this creek here. So let's just try, let's just try scaling it ourselves and just see if we can get it that way. So if there's any, while I'm doing this, it might take me a couple of tries. So if there's any questions or concerns, let me know. It's, it's going to Well, take me there a was a, a uh, question specific to the Netherlands, but basically asking where can people find proper geo data that they could use in SketchUp? Oh, lots of places. Yeah, you're right. That's actually, um, so when you say Netherlands, that geo data is going to be location specific. So what I mean is that um, it's often referred to as open data. So it depends on how well your city is, how well your city does with open data. So what the resources they have, sometimes they get grants, sometimes they partner with Esri, um, sometimes they have their own data, they just have, they make it themselves. So depending on your municipality, they, you could have really good or really, or none at all. And a lot of times they have it because the planners will have it. The question is whether they make it available. Like city of Los Angeles, for example, they make a lot of stuff available via GIS, but you may not have access to it. So, you, you know, I always find a combination of places, um, open street maps. If you're just using, if you're just looking for roads and buildings, go
go to city, go to any city or government's website and go look for their data. You might be able to get high res aerials from them. You also can purchase, I know it costs money, but you can go to, a, you can, there's an extension called Placemaker, which includes near map, which I know we have near map as well. You can buy it straight from geolocation, or you can actually go to near map and buy it from them as well. So if you're looking for free stuff, that's going to depend based on where you live or where you're working. But if you're looking, if you have some money, then there's definitely resources out there. So actually, that's pretty good. So I just kind of manually scaled that, and that's pretty good. So now what I can do is because I'm right above, again, I, I, I try to do this from the very beginning. But since this is a completed model, uh, you're not really seeing all my working stuff. What I would do then is since it's exploded, I can just paint bucket, sample this texture. This master plan now is a texture. And I did one with my grades showing and one without them showing because I didn't know if I was going to show them at the end of the day. And I come in here and click on and go into my mesh. Sometimes you can paint on the outside, depending on how it was built, you know, depending on if it has a material already. And there's that one. And if I go out of here and I'm going to go paint, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to paint that same material. It's projected by default. It's projected. If you paint it and it's all splintered and fractured and it looks crazy, like psychedelic, it's probably because for some reason it's not projected. So you could go into that image, right click it and say text uh, texture projected. By default, I'm pretty sure by default it is projected. So it should be. So if I want to check and hide that, I'm going to need that in a second. So I'll hide it. But and I'm also going to turn my edges back to the normal colored edges because um, I was just using the pink because sometimes when you have when you're drawing on top of images, your lines will disappear. So I always um, change the color of my lines. I don't, so that's, that's, so now um, from there, I would go in and build, I would build some walls. And these are some massive, massive walls. I did these really crudely because they were gonna take forever and I didn't have the time, nor did we have the budget, but I literally just used for, uh, Fredo's joint push pull and I push pulled all of them up at once. And then I just went in and I just moved some of them down. Obviously, they're they're up too high. This is the problem. And this is one I haven't solved. And I would love, again, if I had the time, I would develop an extension that would say, OK, follow, basically follow the top of the slope, but give me a smooth wall because the slope itself might be really irregular. But I want the wall to be smooth. The problem is, is that you can't automate that because right now, if you're either going to say, take the wall, copy it and bring it up, which means you're going to have a wall, uh, a, sorry, take the slope mesh, use that as the top of wall, in which case your top of wall now looks like this, or you're going to do this, which is, means you have a flat wall. Um, you can use something like Curva Shear. Mihai's in the chat if he's still with us. I know it's getting late over there for him. Curva Shear and Curva Loft might be the best solution. Basically, Curva Shear allows you to set up on each curve. You could say, I want this top of wall to be um, 320 feet, and I want this top of wall to be 315 feet, which means that that curve would be a nice sloping down five foot. But still, you can't do it for the whole thing. You have to still take pieces of your model and say top of wall, bottom of wall. So I will say that there's no good way that I know of to do tons of walls that need to follow the slope and still have a clean top of wall. If somebody's got one though, I'm totally open to, I'm totally open to it. So this is pretty crude. This is pretty crude the way that I did it. Again, it was just, but from a distance though, like this, it does give you a pretty good impression about where the, the wall impacts are. Um, and of course the point is, is that the master plan isn't finished. So they're not gonna leave that there like that. So do you remember when I did, I'm going to grab this, I'm going to grab a couple of these really quick. Do I have them in their own group? Yeah, I'm just going to grab a couple of these really quick. Now I'm going to turn those off because I already did them. So, sir, for let's take about, I don't know, take about 10 more minutes. Um, and do, let's just kind of, not finish, finish, but like make this feel like more of a complete idea. So what I wanted to do is paste some trees here, and then I have to turn my tree layer on. And I'm going to turn them. I'm going to pretend like I. I'm going to pretend like I didn't already do them. So just you didn't see that. You didn't see that. There is a good discussion going on in the in the comments about 
the difference between you know civil engineering and designing and that actual site grading you have to pay a, a surveyor and then the actual site um, and then designers just need those tools for the design grade and an architecture an architect would do the schematic plan for the guide and then the civil engineer would actually do the grading plan yeah i'm kind of doing it yeah. that's a good point i mean it it also depends on where as a designer you want to insert your creative control remember when i said that somebody might the engineer if they grade it you know what they're going to do they're going to do what engineers do no offense to engineers but they're going to engineer it so as the designer the more we know the more we work with engineers the more we know how engineers think and what their problems they're solving and how they work and what tools they work with the more we can anticipate those and, and even sometimes push back on them i worked on a project in oregon for the oregon state hospital and there was this gigantic bioswell and i worked with this guy who had been grading by hand for years is uh this guy's amazing you watch him draw these he just draws these tiny little contours by hand and it's it's an art form and he's basically taking an engineering project like a bio a gigantic bioswale and he's sculpting these grades using just pencil the way that i might sculpt it in using artisan so in a way it's like because we had this guy on our team at, on the design team we were able to get a much better result from what otherwise the engineer again not knocking engineers the engineers would just solve the problem here's your bioswale fence around it uh the result was way better because we were able to work with them so so that said, this is where we get to have some fun. Um, so we get to place some trees here. So um, I didn't, if you have the trees in CAD, you can obviously bring them in CAD. And then what you would do is uh, do what's called a block swap. So if you have a tree block and they're already all laid out, that's awesome. Now this is really schematic. So no one did a planting plan. So there was no, there was no, um, there was no CAD, trees that I could just quickly swap. So I just kind of looked at it and thought, okay, well, what kind of trees do we have? We have maybe a couple different kinds of natives, which, and maybe they're not native because they've been, the slope's been regraded. So it means that they're going to sort of look native, look adaptive to the climate, um, but they're going to be new trees. And then of course there's going to be um, what we're going to call more of like the urban street tree that goes along the, the middle of the street. So that's why I have these sort of three trees. Um, from there, and again, I could do a whole lesson on just planting vegetation. And I know I did some of this in when we were doing Tanner Springs, so I won't, I won't kind of belabor the point. But one way to do it is to use the Move tool, and then hit the Option Alt modifier until the little stamp. If you can see it, it's a little um, stamp icon shows up, and you can grab. Well, first I have to select the tree. That would have been the right order of operations, and then you can stamp them. Uh, oh, well, I have to hit the modifier. So if you only use the move tool and the copy, you're going to get one. But if you hit the copy, if you hit the modifier twice, you're going to get the stamp. And it's going to remember, so you can go st stamp, stamp, stamp. And again, I'm going to say it every time because that's what I do when I model. Stamp, stamp. I just say what I'm doing. Stamp, stamp, stamp. Now, if you're only doing a, a few areas or you want to do something that looks more native, that's kind of, that's fine. But uh, the other thing is if I switch to my pink line style, it may actually be quicker to come in here and because I don't have, remember, I don't, we didn't, this, we don't have the line work. I don't have the curbs or the sidewalks. We never got that far. This was a, just an interim study to get that, to get to that point. So what you could do is just take a line here. You could do a freehand line if you, if you wanted, if you have a Cintiq or something and you wanted to freehand it, you could freehand it, or you could just come in here and take, um, a couple of lines like this and just draw, just follow, like go into your parkway and just draw some there. I'm actually going to delete these because I'm going to override it in just a second. And obviously I'm only doing, I say obviously, but I'm just doing just this little section. But what I would do is if the street trees carried all the way through, I could just carry them all the way through and draw a line that follows the street. And then from there, come up here to extensions and you've seen me use this one before i hope path copy i'm a fan of path copy it's going to prompt me and say what do you want to copy i'm going to copy this tree you'll see it already did oh well that goes to show me i did something wrong um it helps to weld uh, your edges first so i'm going to come down here and weld edges and i don't need my plan for this sorry i'm going to try not to 
So I've got this line, right? So I drew this line. So now this line, pretend like it goes, it follows my whole main street. Now I can come up here and go extensions, path copy, click a tree. And because I welded it now, it's gonna go all the way across. Now that's too tight of spacing. That's 10 foot spacing. If I go 30 foot, which is more typical, that's gonna look like a much nicer spacing. Again, depending on the needs, you might wanna go further um, or like if it's, a, if it's a master plan, you might wanna give it a little bit more space. Uh, because you're going to see everything, like if you took an aerial, you may want to space them out. But if you're going to capture a ground level, that could be, uh, could work pretty well. Of course, here, you don't have to go in. I'm just kind of, I'm just eyeballing it. So if the tree's in the middle of the street, I got to go back in. I was just being lazy, so I just strung them all first. And then, of course, you have to go back in and be like, nope, can't have a tree in a driveway. I'm going to delete that one. And in this case, I'm no longer necessarily registering where, where the trees are in the plan because it doesn't really matter anyway. So I think that sort of more of that move stamp option could be good for like when you're doing these ones. I didn't do that again. Again, move copy. I'm so used to doing move copy that I don't do move stamp. If you have scatter, for those that are scatter fans, this would be an excellent scatter exercise, but here's the problem is that again, you need to separate, you need a mesh or to scatter on top of, which means that you would need to separate out the existing tree areas, or sorry, the these sort of uh, natural tree areas to where the driveway, otherwise you're just going to, if you just select the whole terrain, you're going to get trees everywhere. It doesn't, Scatter doesn't know. You can, um, if you wanted trees everywhere but the roads, you could scatter trees everywhere and then tell Scatter to say, I'm going to remove them along the roads. So it's, uh, it just depends on what, what works for you. <clears throat> when you're placing the trees, be careful that you look, check to make sure you look down because you're going to get this quite a bit. You're going to, it's when you're looking at it uh, from above, it's going to be hard to see that that tree is actually floating. And when ready, do you remember how, remember that's why we did that little warm up exercise? Work, we work in, I say we, I work in, in above in 2D. And then I've got my grading. So I've got done all my work. I've got my, my existing grades. I've got my proposed grades. I have my hill context from Google Earth. And I've gone in and just, just placed a bunch of trees, maybe took about half an hour, listened to some music, had some fun. And I'm going to go ahead and use my drop GC. And there they go. Oh, that one didn't go. That's OK. That should go. And now, as Bob Ross likes to say, who I like to quote, we've got a bunch of happy little trees um, sitting on the slope. So the buildings are a little bit different. They, um, you can drop them, but I'll show you an example in just a second here. If I take one and just kind of take one down, pass it around. Okay. So if you laid out your buildings for any reason, buildings are a little bit different because, um, let's see, let's see. So if I laid this one, if that one goes there, the challenge with this one is going to be, and I'll show you, you can lay out all the buildings just like you did here, um, and then go ahead and use the same drop GC command. But remember, it's going to hit at that access point. So part you'll see here, let's go, well, let's just go look at it. And I'll stop talking. We'll just go see. And this is probably a good idea since I'm not tracing. I'll just pop back over to my gray lines. What's going to happen is that it's going to be floating because it's going to stop at the first point that it hits. And so when you're dropping it onto a slope, it's going to hit high and it's going to stay high. So what you have to do is basically uh, at that point, come in. Each one of these just needs to be manually dropped in. And this is where this is where we're going to take some artistic license because this is just a really a, a real loose concept. I'm not too worried if at this point, if this person's pad you know, doesn't touch uh, the slope. That's not really the point of this exercise. And especially too, if someone's garage, you're like, well, no, you'll call me out on that and say, oh, your garage is, you can't get into it. Okay, I know, I know. But when you're viewing it from a distance, the point here is that it's more important for me not to have these big um, glaring gaps that this is where the stamp tool, if you really wanted to, you'd come in with the stamp tool and you maybe pick that edge back up, which I don't. I'm just gonna go in and just drop that in so that it sits flush for the most part. And when I back up and I look at it from this angle, it looks good. And when I turn around this side and I look at it from this angle, um, it looks good. 
Again, I'm just as a concept. It looks good. It's good enough. It's good enough for what we're doing. I've been told many times, like perfection is the enemy of of good here. Just just set it and and move on to the next one. So that's it. I'm gonna stop. We're gonna end early. We're gonna do so. We're gonna do a few minutes of Q and A, and then we're gonna end a little bit early because, like I said, it's the new year. We're easing into it. I hope you felt like that was easing into it. If I click on, if I delete that, because I'm going to delete all of these um, trees that I just placed, because you'll notice that I already did it earlier, years ago. So if I click this little button here, it's going to bring everything back together again. And I'm going to delete my floating site plan. Obviously, I wouldn't actually delete it in real life. I would always keep that information there. I would just put it, I'd either hide it and save it to a scene, or I'd put my 2D information on its own tag. So even when I'm ready to capture my views, I don't actually lose any of that working information because you're going to need it, I promise you. It's not if it changes, it's when it changes, I like to tell myself. And ultimately, this was the end product. It was to get down. Uh, to this reservoir, it's a scenic area, and there's a highway and a reservoir. And it was to look at this and say, how bad is those is the grading that you're going to do? Uh, what's the impact? And and obviously, there's there are some areas that would sort of kind of need to be either massaged from a wall perspective, or would probably be need to um, maybe need to be re redesigned, depending on what the city comes back and says. Nope, it's not going to fly. That's too big. Not going to fly. So Donovan, since you're my co-host. Yeah. Give me one thing. Give me something that you can see that you might work that you from this. I know you don't do grading, but what what did we cover that you're like? Well, actually, that might be relevant to my workflow. Um, on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I really like drop. I think that uh, is as practical a tool for a noob like me that can be garnered from such an advanced class. I say class, it wasn't class, from this live session uh, that we did here together that I think I could find a way to implement into, into you know, things that I create on my iPad. So yeah. Cool. I love how you say like easing it. It's a new year, we're easing into it. I'm from Montana. January the 1st, we would always go out and cut a hole in the ice in the lake and jump in. It was the midnight polar bear swim to like to bring in the new year. I felt like this is the equivalent of a midnight polar bear swim to bring in a new year because, oh boy, <laughs> easing into 2023 with Eric. Well, you know what? I, you know, you know me, I don't do anything easy. Um, I, I, I will say that, um, I will say that, that, that this is a good thing for me because I think 2023, we all like, I think we were still shaking a little bit of the COVID dust off of 2022. Uh, I hope everyone feels, I know it's not the same for everyone, depending on which country you're in, but I hope that 2023 really does feel like, you know, we did base camp uh, just in September. That was kind of like the, ch the, the change in the air that we need. So I'm excited for what I'm going to learn this year. I'm excited for what I'm going to teach this year. I'm excited for the new people for the, I'm excited to have the people that are, are regulars on this stream uh continuing to to join us every friday and i'm and i'm excited for um uh to get some new people in for some people that too that are that have been waiting for some of these some of these what you're going to call i'm going to call them polar bear plunge uh sessions you know it's it's, it's going to be great yep. to sort of get that sort of expand our audience a little bit into that area i'm not saying we don't already do that i'm just saying that 2023 that's that's my goal is to sort of cast a little bit of that wider net so did That's have it. a question saying, could you copy the line where your retaining walls meet the grade and then move them up to the top of the wall? Copy the line where my retaining walls meet the grade and copy. Yes, uh, let's do that. Uh, we have a few minutes. We have a few minutes. If it's going to take a long time, I'll just say yes, you could do that. But let's because uh, I was actually thinking about that and I was like, uh, should I demo that? I think that's going to take a while, but um, let's try and people little... like your uh, happy little uh, trees in the sky. Oh, yeah, I use this watermark a lot because it's um, it looks kind of like a, oh, you mean these ones? My little trees, my sky trees. Oh, yeah, if anyone hasn't seen Avatar, you know, you would expect to see trees up in the sky. So and I'm not getting paid to plug it, just saying I saw it over the break. So 
floating islands is is not something not something that's unusual. Um, yeah, let's do that. Let me turn off my buildings really quick, and let me turn off my trees really quick, and then I may have to turn off my walls. And I'm going to turn off my I'm going to go to my working view, and I'm going to go proposed, and I'm going to go existing, and all right, so that we're just kind of hopefully dealing with. All right, is that maybe that's better? And then uh, I need to turn off this one. All right, so that kind of gets me back to where I would be if I was just doing my walls. Okay, so let's take, if anyone's got to jump off, thank you, uh, I'll say it now. Thank you for watching. Thank you for, for sticking with us today. Thanks for watching in the past. But for those that want to, that have a few more minutes, we're just going to try play around with this wall and then I'm going to go ahead and cut it because we're getting close to time. So, so the question was, is could you take this, could you take this piece here Yes and no. Here's why. It's because you'll notice that the existing grade doesn't know where that wall is. So the problem is, is if I go, it may help to do color by tag. I'm going to give my walls, I don't know what color, it does not matter as long as the colors are different. And I really don't like this brown color, so I'm going to just give that like a light gray color. And the proposed grade is going to be something like a nice light green. Okay. So, so I've got my existing, my proposed, and my walls. So let's see here. So if I wanted this wall to follow, here's the deal is that you have two different grades, remember? Because it's actually, you have a, you have an existing, which is up high, and you have a proposed, which is down low. So the only problem with using the existing grades as a top of wall, and this is why, again, I thought of this and I haven't done it because I don't know that it solves the problem. You'd have to go in here and grab what is, I think, the edge of the existing. I'm going to copy that, paste that in place. I'm going to leave it there for a second. And then I'm going to come in here to my proposed. And I don't know how to do this, how I can see it. I might just have to guess. Oh, no, I know why. I can do it here. I don't need all of that. I just need this part. So let's just pretend we're just going to do that back wall that curves. So I'd come into my proposed and I have to it has to also um, intersect. You'd have to intersect with this wall because you have to have that line. So if I do this, I'd have to separate out this one wall. Again, this is assuming I hadn't already modeled this wall. If somebody's got a better way, I'm definitely open my open to it. So if this is if this is my wall uh, as is. This is my wall as is, and you notice that I want it to start low, go high, and drop back down. That's that's going to be the challenge. The only way to really do that properly, again, is to sit here and say, I'm going to grade the wall the same way that I graded my slope. I'm going to draw, I'm going to put a contour, a spot, or a line that says, here's my top of wall. It needs to be at this elevation. Here's my bottom of wall. It needs to be at this elevation. So if I tried to use the existing terrain, I would firstly, I would firstly need this wall to intersect with this terrain because this terrain here, this doesn't know where that wall is unless I turn my hidden geometry on, in which case that line is that wall, this line here. But then you got to be really careful because you're going in for each of those, you're going in and you're selecting the hidden geometry and you're saying that's my top of wall or where the proposed grade is. Copy that, pop out of there, turn my hidden geometry off, paste it. I probably need to unsoften it. This is usually when the point when someone says, oh, how would I do that? Because if I do We're that- We're getting a lot of intersect, 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 intersect faces. Yes, yes, but yeah, you can, inter yeah, okay, fine. We'll just intersect. Right That's mouse click and it's under make group. I know where that is. I, we've showed it three times. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just reading the comments. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm not, I'm not saying don't help. I'm definitely appreciative. I'm just saying that, like, you, I, we, we covered this. Okay, um, okay. So you're right. But here's the thing: is that remember what I was saying? Is you want to intersect? You don't want to intersect everything. So what you would do this is you would do this kind of wall by wall. Or you could do this in small groups. You would take a group of walls and then you intersect. You don't want to intersect every single one of your walls. That could actually, you know, it could, you could be sitting and waiting for a while. So I'm going to take that, take that, right click, intersect. And if this doesn't work, I'm calling it. But I think I think we might be onto something. Intersect with selection. 
because I'm only um, inter I'm, I'm intersecting a really big mesh, but I'm only intersecting it with one wall, so it shouldn't be too complex. Now I have this line. So see that line there? So grab that line, copy it, get out of that group, paste it in place. If I hide these two, again, I could use tags. See, it's this is where I'm, this is why I haven't done this is because it's, it's just, it's, I just don't know that it's ultimately any better. Like here now I have to, I now have the, here's my existing grade and here's my proposed grade. My, so what I would do is connect those two and I have a line that represents that. There is an extension. So if I offset that, offset that, you can't offset, you can't offset a line that's curved because I need a double line to make a face. So yes, I mean, you could, you could, oh, you could do this, use the sandbox tool to make a mesh out of that and then grab this wall here, turning all of these off, turning everything off. Explode the curve. Okay, oh, walls. All right, I'm gonna grab this wall again. And then I'm, and then after that, I'm, I'm gonna call it. Okay, so paste that in place. All right. So one way to do this would be to bring this wall up like that. I can use the existing grades to basically create a mesh, and this mesh here is kind of like um, it's kind of like my a clipping mesh. We've already done this, right? So I'm going to make this slightly bigger than it needs to be, um, just to make sure. Well, I'm going to do that again, just to make sure that it's larger than my wall, if that makes sense. So I need to make sure that I've clipped it. You can see right here, it's not clipping. It's not clipping all the way. And then from there, I would go in and say, okay, intersect faces. Somebody who's like, who like uses civil 3Ds for like, oh yeah, you just say top of wall, you just say bottom wall, and need to fill it in. So that's why I don't like these kind of methods because it's like, eh, it's not a clean way to do it. Um, see, and then you delete all this stuff, delete that, delete that, delete that. What you're left with then is if I clean this up, if I take the time to clean this up, you're left with a wall that does now I have a retaining wall that goes down and it does have the lines. I would want to, again, I need to fill in. Um, yeah. So I've got a wall that then does follow. If I turn on my, if I turn on my proposed grading again, and I'm going to, as soon as I do this, I'm going to say goodbye. Where's my existing? There it is. Unhide. Unhide. All right. So that way you would take that wall and you'd bring it up by about a foot. And I'd say a foot because I'm exaggerating it because what you want to do is make sure that your wall comes up above. You might want to say two feet, two feet, maybe even three feet. What you would do is you want to make sure just your wall comes up above the surface. Even if in reality, it's only three inches, this is master planning. So we would, ex we would um, exaggerate that scale. So if you did want to, and there may be a better way, if I thought about it and I worked through some options, there might be a better way to actually grab to, to basically project your wall line work down onto those existing, you'd have to basically create an existing and proposed mesh, flatten it, project that wall line work down, bring it up. There's definitely ways to do it, but just nothing that's as simple as I'm as I want. So I was hoping to end on a high note. I'm ending on a low note now. Oh man. <laughs> okay, hang on. I'm gonna press. I'm sorry, we totally threw it off your groove. Okay. All right, I'm going big because uh, so you can see me big so that I can say thanks to everyone. Um, Donovan, don't let me forget. Oh, I do want to say real quick before I let you go, Tyson is going to be our modeler next week. So I don't know what he's doing, but it's the new year. So we're going to kind of, again, we're easing into things. He's going to come up with something awesome as always. We've got a new skill builder coming out every single Tuesday. So make sure if you haven't already subscribed to the YouTube channel, so you're getting those little 10 minute, 15 minute videos, those come out every Tuesday. You don't wanna miss those. It's all of us doing what we're doing here in the live modeling, but in bite-sized chunks. Uh, same thing, once this video is done, go back, watch it again, shoot us some comments, and I will just keep that conversation going there in the comment thread. Donovan, take us home. Yeah. If you, uh, if you guys like this, um, 
do do all the social media things. If you find this content helpful and you have friends that you think would benefit uh, getting into SketchUp for something fun and simple like turning a rectangle into a house or something complex like everything that we saw Eric just do, um, you can go ahead and, and share this content with them. It's it's we love making this content. We love sharing it out with you guys. We love hanging out with you in the chat. Uh, so thank you everyone who hung out with us in the chat. We can't wait to do it again next week. All right. On that note, we'll see you next week. Happy New Year, everyone. Thanks for watching.